and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I've got a whole crew of newcomers today. We have Glenn Myers, Josh, and Luanka. I'm... I probably got that wrong, and I apologize in advance. The triple-headed monster that is the Tabletop Journeys. Now now coming to us with the Traveler's Guide to Factions. How y'all doing tonight? Oh, we're doing awesome, Elder. How are you doing tonight? I'm, do I'm doing good. I got to see my twins actually, actually win a playoff series for once. Um, first time that's happened since 2004. And I got... And that means there's one more Toronto team that that is absolutely trash. Usually, I just you and usually I have to wait for the leaves to fall in the spring. Yeah. <laughs> Your but, microphone is still up, Lewanika. You can't talk like that. Right yes, it, it helps if I've got the microphone down. <laughs> so uh, we are professionals. You know, we <laughs> little details, little details. Um, yeah, we're doing great. I mean, it's been a Busy, busy couple of weeks, months getting ready for our current Kickstarter. Uh, work is going uh, like gangbusters on getting uh, the book ready. Uh, I'm sure we'll get into it, but uh, our effort and drive to have so much of this done before the close of the campaign so we can be rapid and quick with our delivery of the product is really our, our drive at this point. Um, and really we come up for air when it's time to talk to, to shows and great audiences like yours and, uh, you know, talk about the book, let you know what's out there. So we have more people that kind of know what tabletop journeys is, what tabletop journeys is about and the kind of, uh, con game content that we're, that we're putting out there into the universe. Yeah. Now I do have to abide by a bit of a tradition that I have, and that is going into the origin story, the humble beginnings. Mm. So there's nothing humble about this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we That's even in our opening, as we say, we are not so humble hosts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We. <laughs> I come from yeah. the Muhammad Let's Ali see. school of of, of humbleosity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I am well, the greatest. <laughs> <laughs> so let me. Get, I'll give you the dime tour, I guess, uh, to yeah. start. So uh, tabletop journeys. Uh, so we are a podcast as well as a kind of a content creation company, and mm -hmm. we, uh, like so many other things, kind of emerged from the COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, with Luanika and I, we just kind of got in the habit of talking for hours on end on Zoom about Dungeons and Dragons in particular. We're talking a lot about five E and stuff like that, and you know, we kind of. Uh, I don't know, we'd been talking about doing a podcast for a really, really long time, uh, and we just kind of never, like, for like a decade or more, and we just kind of never got the magic together. Like, we had some, we thought about doing some topics, and none of them really sang, and, you know, for, we we were going to do, like, a politics podcast for a while, and then politics stopped being funny around 2016, so, you know, we, uh, we decided to, you know, to scrap that, and then, like I said, you know, November of 2020, uh, one day I was just like, wait a minute, why don't we do a gaming podcast? And Lee Winnie was like, yes, that is a, it, it, absolutely what we should do. Um, and then it was a less than a month later or so, we brought Glenn on because we needed a, a third voice to... Yeah. Yeah, to, to either moderate when uh, when Lee Winika and I spun into opposite directions at light speed, uh, or to offer a contrary view when Lee Winika and I were in absolute lockstep, because that tends right. to be kind of how we roll. So, uh, you know, uh, so we brought Glenn on about six weeks later, and then kind of officially uh, launched out to the big wide world on uh, in January of 2021, uh, and it's been just a crazy ride since then. Like that's just kind of the and, only way to go ahead and describe it. Some of the things we've yeah. done have been amazing. So. Yeah, I gotta yeah. say I'm so glad that my voice fit in so well, and that I mean these two were already my friends, um, but at the time I was working on trying to figure out what I wanted to do and what I was going to start, and I was already doing some content creation of my own and a little bit of game design, and then I heard that they had launched, and I went to them. I'm like, guys, I want in, and they took me because they're awesome. Yeah, and <laughs> now here we are, Aww. like three Aww. years yeah. later. Well, mm -hmm. I know it. Right? Oh. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and somewhere along that journey, and I mean very quickly along that journey, we had decided that um, 
part of our drive as storytellers and creators is we wanted to create content. Uh, we kind of looked into the industry. We saw so many things that we loved and so many things that we liked, but we also saw so many things that we felt were missing. And uh, somewhere along the way, and some of those things were the things that we were doing at our game tables and the topics we were talking about on our shows. Um, there's a secret to what we do. If you want to know where we're headed, listen to our podcast. You will have a pretty good <laughs> idea of where our minds are and the types of things we're missing in games and the types of things we're focused on getting ready to create just by listening to our shows because we tend to talk about the topics that are fresh on our mind as we're about to create right. so and, you know I mean, that even drive before we did I this said. we were already creating even if it was just yeah, for our yeah. own games now we just bring it into the podcast and dress it up and make it pretty sorry Lee yep. oh no no that's exactly it mm-hmm. what used to be about our our, our games uh, our home tables came into the podcast and were topics to go out there and help build the community and show people here are some ways that we find enjoyable and we are pretty sure that you will as well we found that those were very well received and then we found that the next step is really putting that in print so it's accessible to folks to have at their game because i don't know if you're like me or many people are like me but I can listen to a, a radio show or a podcast or a television show, have a great idea, and it's in my head, and, it, and, it, and it's in the pocket, and I'll use it in drips and drabs. But three weeks later, two months later, it's having that document to go back to when I'm building the next adventure or when I'm creating right. the next character I'm going to play that, that, really, uh, that really gets me going. So we really feel uh, kind of the need of this platform as third party creators is to just build good things that players want to play storytellers dms and dms want to run and mm. and that tables will enjoy and uh like the tagline says that's what's going to make your next game legendary yeah um it is a, it is a bit amusing that you get that you guys and my own crew have um kind of have kind of have that parallel intersection especially with how things shifted once um co- once covid happened well, as- yeah. um aside from aside from the fact that I ended up lo- I ended up losing a ton of weight cuz I did I did a hell of a lot of exercising around that time I lost like 80 pounds um <laughs> I found it and <laughs> of course the it's already at my size it's already a royal pain to to get clothes it was just as much after I lost the weight, because mm-hmm. I still have to go to like DXL or something. I can't go to regular places because they don't ser- they don't serve guys who are my who are my size. <laughs> mm. But right. what I there were certain current event stuff that I would that I would cover on the on the Sunday shows, but it started getting way repetitive. So I I pivoted over to a topic based affair that we call Geek Watch, and it's I've been doing that for about I'd say I'd say about two or three years now and it's wor- and it's worked out so far um, do you involve your uh, your fans and audience in geek watch oh uh, I do I do take suggestions for um, topics mm-hmm. the key the key thing is that it's a topic that there has to be a certain angle I can build around it isn't ju- it isn't just to say oh talk talk about why why X thing is gr- is great. There's not a whole lot right. of meat on the bones like I can do to make that interesting. Yeah, it's got to um, resonate. Yeah, there has. To I be totally th- get that. There has to be a theme that that I can, that I can build around. Um, to use it to use a recent um, example. Um, a while back, a while back, Night Dive had put out a tweet saying, "What would your dream boomer shooter look like?" And I had pitched I had, I had pitched the idea to my colleagues of, "Okay, let's take this, but let's." Do something a bit more Japanese horror um, of an approach. I need a <laughs> definition of the word boomer shooter. Um, that is that is a catch-all yeah. for um, first-person shooter games that are be- that are being made in the style of a lot of the pioneers back in the '90s. You know, what, whether it be whether it be Doom, whether it be the Holy Trinity of build games. Um, whether it even so we're talking about designed by boomers, not shooting boomers. No, it, that's the, that's yeah. That as far as the age, that's that's kind of irrelevant. But it's bi- it's built around that style. 
that's just the name that stuck because old school shooter just had was just too broad, I guess. We, um, we needed to throw in like a a uh, discriminatory age term instead. I <laughs> didn't come up with the term. Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> It's when I, I'm not shooting the messenger. I, I, I'm I'm cool with it now that I know that it's not about shooting boomers mm -hmm. or something about making them die because there's a big boomer movement out there about that. And if it had anything to do with that, then I was going to sign off and say, "Sorry, no. buddy, this isn't the show for me." <laughs> <laughs> no, like most of the stuff that New Blood puts out is is in that category. A lot of the stuff that Night Dive puts out, especially since they've been doing a lot of remastering work with with older games, because trying to run old PC games on modern tech is a um, challenge yes oh um, they don't you'd think that they'd run better because the modern system has so much more memory than you know the computer back when it first came out with only like 64 ram but no it doesn't yeah it's more of a future proofing okay issue not even a lot of them have it where the speed of the game is tied to the potential speed of the graphics card without a limiter so right. if i were to run the like say the original test drive without um doing a few tweaks um It'd be it'd be like a, it'd be like the like every car is in warp speed mode. Just the whole thing would be weight would be way too fast. Right, the handling would be would be a bitch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like thinking about that, that's kind of like one of the things that we think about when we're creating stuff for our content. Like we will frequently go back to older versions of D and D. We'll go back yeah. to the red box. We'll go back to second, especially second edition splat books, uh, and, and even some of the third edition splat, splat books. Because one of the things we feel that Five E has been missing greatly is context for their games. They're oh, very yeah. good about about the mechanics. They're very good about the basics of an adventure. I mean, solid. Like I'm actually kind of a fan of some most of that, as far as their adventures go. Uh, but what they are absolutely missing is the context. What's the story behind the story? You know, you're in a town, you're going through this, here's this group that tells you to, to go after a goal, but what's the story about that goal? Why does your PC connect to that goal? And that's exactly where our book Factions comes in. We are providing detailed factions, not the limited use factions that they expect you to go out and buy 30 uh 20 year old novels to which are good books by the way but to expect anybody to get up today who's just started playing D&D &D, to go buy 30 or 40 novels to get the backstory on the Harpers or uh the 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 Emerald Conclave is foolish they're not going to do it especially so if they want to make their own absolutely right. so what we wanted to do was say Look, we can't touch those products because they're an IP, but we're going to give you two things. One, here are nine amazing factions with deep lore, deep yeah. context. We're talking traditions, superstitions. We're talking how you join this organization, what the training is like, what kind of resources might be brought to bear on your behalf or you can request uh, for, for your adventures what it's like for them to be your friend and your patron, what it's like for them to be your opposition, your antagonist, or even your direct enemy. And as importantly, what it's like to come from that organization or try to join that organization. So yeah. we're going to detail... Or, or to try to get right. out from that. Or how it you deals know. with the world and its strategies and goals. and Absolutely. Yeah. You know, l like Pacino said, I thought I was out! But they pulled me back in. Yeah. You know, we want to create those moments at the table. Yes, Josh, I went Pacino on you. Um, I, it was bound to happen. I was going to pull at least one good movie reference oh, wow. before this night yeah. was done. You know, and that's one of my favorite ones, right? So, um, but at the end of the day, we want to give players the ability to interact with those in a way that 5e just really hasn't provided the mechanism to. They would 5e allows it. That's why we're some of our mechanics are in that base rule, mm -hmm. but it doesn't support it. And so we're here to support that style of play. But what we also wanted to do was say, Watsy's well, not the only game in town. There are other systems out there. And one of yep. the biggest features of our of what we're doing this time around is our the bulk of this book is system agnostic. It's the lore, it's the traditions, it's all those elements we spoke about. Then there's going to be a separate section with some basic 5e mechanics, stat blocks, so you can set it in a 5e game, whether that be the high fantasy game we're talking about, 
or Evil Genius Games, uh, Everyday Heroes, or any other 5e port like Army Men, uh, th which is a great new game just off Kickstarter, getting set to go out to fans any day now. Um, full disclosure, I did some editing on that project. So, I mean, but it's an amazing game. And I said that long before. I was even pegged to do some of that editing. We had yeah. previewed that game. Uh, no, it with, was it was our interaction and, and, with the game designers that got you that gig. Yes, when we, yeah, when you we know, did the game I, on our I show. I was so absolutely in love with, with that game that when uh, the publisher said, hey, uh, would you be interested in doing X? I was like, yes. He's like, so let's talk about the the compensation piece. I'm like, okay, we'll get there. But I was in, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, you know, we wanted to make sure that our lore and the concept of having factions got to every game, every system. And so we've got that there. We have some stretch goals for some other games. We have amazing stretch goals to expand the reach of this project uh, with art, with uh, additional content. The, uh, if we hit our, our highest stretch goal, we'll even get some unique encounter maps for each of the factions. We've we've, we've teamed up with uh, an amazing uh, map creator, uh, someone I've been following for years. I've been a, a patron of that individual. I'm honored to have him even remotely associated with our project and really hoping our backers back us enough so we can get to that tier so we can show him some love as well uh, with this project and uh, involve all of the other of his, uh, my fellow patrons of that site mm -hmm. you know that's what we're really trying to do we're just trying to expand the scope of the game and the scope of play for all these tables that are out there yeah and that does touch on something that i find uh, i find a bit um, a bit amusing because it it's something i've been critical of what of the world's most ubiquitous role-playing game for years because i mm -hmm. Some people, some people have have tried to figure out whether or not whether or not I consider myself old school when it comes when it comes to er the earlier days or new school. And I've always told them if you if you're asking that question, um, you're on the wrong side, because <laughs> I I am I am neither I am neither and both and as I told you guys before I went we went live, um, both si both sides are e are equally targets for um, roasting. Because right. one particular thing I've I have picked on D and D about for the for the longest time is this, um, for lack of a better term, shit or get off the pot attitude regarding worlds. Um, <laughs> in particular, what I mean by what I mean by that is when there's that question of what sort of fantasy D and D is supposed to be. It's it's one where the where the designers, whether it be in fifth edition, whether it be in fourth, whether it be in third, advanced second or whatnot, there's some people who can claim implied setting, which I can't stand that phrase, but they want to have it both ways, wanting to have it that you could be, that you could make it in any setting you want, but also having rules that are that are supposed to be talking about some sort of implied setting. You can't have that both ways, and. I can't help but I, when I look at a lot of the ways that things have been supported, especially with um, core 5e. I'm not talking third party. That's always going to be great. You and you guys have probably seen seen this as well. There's there's the there's the joke. There's always the joke about murder hobos, but I can't really blame people who who play like that because there's not really a whole lot of guidance. To do much in the way, much in the way beyond that. I mean, you look at the G look at the GM's guide. There's not a whole lot of guidance to even do other styles of um, fantasy, sure. and what there is in there um, is really, really dumb. Like that whole, oh, you can, oh, you can just reskin the paladin to make a samurai. No. Oh yeah, let me. So let me go a whole other. Yeah. Let me dive into that for a minute because that's mm -hmm. that's something that I'm really super passionate about because I think that you're absolutely right that. Wizards of the Coast in general, and particularly with D&D &D 5, does not do a good job of giving storytellers tools to run great games. I mean, they really don't. Like, any they, any they, they don't teach you how to run it. The, yeah. the referee right. is what and, he needs to than, help make that happen. Yeah. I and call more this handbreaking. Yeah. Uh, and more than that, 
players are rewarded for the type of behavior that creates the murder hobo scenario, right? Mm -hmm. Because they are rewarded with XP, they are rewarded with infamy, they are reward they are rewarded for that. Because that's you know, when it, when a game with is whatever is in the dead guy's pockets. Mechanics. Exactly right. When the when the game is seventy five percent combat mechanics, we cannot fault the players for falling into that. It is in the hands of the storytellers to go ahead and make a better game, uh, and. D and D five does not do a good job of telling storytellers how to go ahead and do that. So you are precisely talking about the thing that we try to do in That's all the of gap our projects. We're trying to fill. So it's... the 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 Traveler's Guide to Factions is our fourth book in this Traveler's Guide series that I think we're kind of it's kind of like unofficial. Like we call it, the Traveler's Guides are kind of like our, our our shtick, right? But the first one was the Traveler's Guide to Collaborative World Building. It was to give a tool to storytellers explicitly to crack open the games that they are running, bring their players to the table, and let them invest in the game a little bit so that they feel more invested in the world that you're trying to run. It was a series of roll tables with inventive prompts to go ahead and do just that. And it was a it was it was designed that way specifically because we could create a 300-page book about how do you become a better storyteller. Other people have written that book. I mean, there are plenty of books out there that you could read about how to become a better storyteller, right? I mean, I'm looking at Keith Ammon and all these other people that you could go ahead and do that right? mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, right, totally, right? So, you know, instead, we said, here's a tool. We're not going to teach you how to go ahead and, and use the screwdriver. We're just going to give you the screwdriver and then let you figure out how best to use the screwdriver in your particular Give people the blue scenario, bucket of Legos. Right? Yeah. Give people the blue bucket of the Legos and let them build the castle. Exactly, right? You know. Um, and so like, so that's kind of how we started. It's like, how do you go ahead and crack open the game? How do you bring your players in? Then we went into other things where we're diving into uh, into other uh, other world building type stuff with with the uh, Travel's Guide to the Multiverse, which again was again, a lot of a options to players. Yeah, to exactly. Bring those yeah. players in and yeah. help them feel more attached to their characters and alive in your world. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna cut in briefly because well, as we began this as a response to the setting agnostic piece of what we do it is important to note the traveler's guide uh to collaborative world buildings by the way at copper seller on dm's guild and uh you can anybody who's interested can go there and uh go ahead and pick that up it's a really affordable and excellent tool for storytellers to get into uh or even for players if they want to make characters in their downtime it's a great uh way to prompt but that has a number of tables that have nothing to do with the high fantasy game we specifically right. made sure that they were tables that were again system and setting agnostic so when yeah. we talk about that we also talk about genre more than we talk about system uh yeah. because that's the thing if you want to run a horror game there's a way to do a horror game it doesn't matter the game you're playing what matters is it's a horror game if you want to run a sci-fi game it doesn't matter what uh, system you're using what matters is that it's a sci-fi game so we build lore for the genres and that's yep. kind of what we did with collaborative world building and then i'll let josh continue with the with the yep. traveler's guide to the to the multiverse which was our second yeah. project our second project was the traveler's guide to the multiverse again it was largely D, &D focused because that's kind of the hot, at that point it was really the hot hand in town right um but again what we were trying to do is introduce new options that were interesting for the players and created hooks for the storytellers to go ahead and make things more fun and more interesting half of that book was dedicated to like short you know one paragraph to like half a page long adventure hooks they were really just kind of prompts it's like you know maybe a couple of questions uh maybe a couple of directions everything like that and say you know here storyteller run this adventure right and that's a concept that we kind of expanded on for the our third book which came out last year our first kickstarter project uh which ha was the it was, it was a, a set of subclasses uh four or five e ostensibly and then a whole set of other rules that went along with it and the big thing that came with that half of that book was dedicated to adventure starters 10 right. to 12 pages or like 10 to 12 encounters of how to start an adventure and then half a page of questions to say okay now that you have reached this goal or you've done this thing you have run through these 12 encounters where do you want this where do you want this campaign to go from here here are some thoughts here are some some suggestions here are some questions that you as the storyteller can answer and pick which one resonates for you here are things that we think you could do with this so you know we really and you know i think ultimately those kind of decisions fed our 
decision to make a book that is going to be like 90% system agnostic. We're hanging some 5e rules in there because, again, as kind of the hot hand in town, it's nice to be able to kind of make 5e compatible rules for people that are playing Dungeons and Dragons or playing any 5e engine. Uh, as we explore these factions, not just through kind of the high fantasy setting that Luminico was talking about, but through steampunk, through near future, dystopian future, far future. So, like, if you're playing like a Star Trek game and you want to go ahead and use one of these factions, the lore still works, the history still works, and you can still bring it into whatever is, uh, is running in your game. That is absolutely the focus of this, is to go ahead and make it so that, you know, like we keep saying, any game, any time, any system, use where you can go ahead and use this book. And that's kind of what we try to design in general, in, uh, uh, just as a new wordplay that I'm experimenting with that came, came to me today, is even though we're, we're writing it, even though we're putting it down, we're giving you questions to kind of make it a choose-your-own-adventure. That's the style of, of play, because we want you, the storyteller, to choose the parts you want in your adventure. You're going to take the parts that you like, not all of them, right? So we try to deliberately make things so that they can be lifted and and moved and give you ideas on how to bind them in and make them fit your world, because, yeah. you know, that's what, what's going to help the most people. Oh, yeah. And when mentioning genre, you do, you do touch on something that's been a pet peeve of mine personally, and I've meant I've mentioned this many times on the um, po on the podcast, whether it be through the monastery or th or through Geek Watch or um, Valley of the Judged, and that is the way pe the way people treat certain jo certain genres of storytelling, as if as if this as if it's a one size fits all affair. Um, I suppose yeah. the best example is the fact that. I've always resented the idea that if I'm doing something that is high fantasy, that it has to be in that Western European Tolkien-esque pastiche. I got nothing but love for Tolkien's work. Don't get don't get it twisted. What I don't care for is the idea that that's what I have to do. That's something I call design by gospel, and it's not it's not a good idea because there's there's this there's this massive variety of approaches. That you can take with fa with fantasy. There's no reason that I have to be doing an, a poor man's XP of Middle Earth or a poor man's XP of Conan. Right. That's one of the powers yeah. you have as being the world builder and sitting in the storyteller chair is you get to decide the kind of fantasy that you want to create and you get to decide the kind of game that you're going to run for your players. So if yeah. you're tired of classic tropes, Open your bag of tricks and you know, pull out some new material. Yeah. And, the, and that's, I, that's, that's where we're looking to give you new hammers, yeah. Yeah, the, and that's the key. Everybody's bag of tricks is going to be mildly different, but there should be some universal tools that are in there. Mm -hmm. What we're hoping to, to do is use books like the Collaborative Guide to World Building, uh, the, the uh, subclasses of the multiverse, and uh, Tabletop Journey's uh, Guide to Factions to be part of that universal piece. So that you can take the the techniques and the information, specifically the lore, but the techniques that we discuss and the story prompts that we provide, and you can put those again into any system. The only thing that's uh, that 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 has to do with the mechanics of any game is going to be stat blocks, which because almost everybody plays Five E or has played Five E at some point, that will give them a baseline to look at it and say, okay, I can extrapolate from here, uh, and and some base mechanics for a few things. And and those are all sectioned off separately, purposefully. Mm -hmm. you know. And then what we have the ability to do as we expand our knowledge base, as our audiences and our fans talk to us about other games that they'd like us to create for, mm -hmm. we can always come back and create that same mechanics piece for a new game, provided the IP and the rules surrounding that particular game system work uh, in our favor as far as... As long as, as the as licensing it. allows it. Yeah. If licensing allows, we can move to any system to build those pieces. And I think that's what we really wanted to do. We wanted to set the framework, uh, but we didn't want it to be just a skeleton. We wanted this to be a full body of work. And then we can add things on as time goes 
to make it adapt to other things. So there are other things in the pipeline uh, to move into other systems. Again, as audience goes, there's going to be backer surveys. You know, here's what we were able to put together for this one. What's the next system you'd be interested in? That type of thing so we can see where they go. Um, You know, and I have a feeling that we're going to get to some very interesting places because we really do listen to our audience and try to adapt what we do to be we have a vision Mm -hmm. but there's nothing wrong with adapting your vision so that it can bring in more folks well part of our vision is listening to the community and improving the overall ttrpg community right so yeah. yeah absolutely and part of that is connecting with them so if we're building things that connect then that's what we're then we're doing something right and What's kind of, what's kind of funny about the I, about the idea of in, of integrating um, fa- of integrating factions, especially on the on the play on the player end and on the GM end, is the the idea of fa- of faction design is not new, is not new. The tools a lot of the tools have been have been there for for quite a while. I mean, mm-hmm. I would I'm not going to say it invented it, but I look at some. I look at things like Ars Magica and World of Darkness as two entries that yep. certainly helped popularize the concept of um, f- of factions within a, within a game's um, sandbox. And oh, sure. yeah. of, co- of course, if I have to use if I have to use something that's a little bit a little bit cl- a little bit closer to the twenty sided bubble, um, are any of you familiar with Birthright? Yes, very much so. Birthright's yeah. the put out, yeah, yeah, uh, the old A D and D counterpart to Dungeons and Dragons, where there was a set number of of kingdoms, and you were playing the You're playing the monarchs, and, yep. the monarchs yeah. and seneschals and family lines and lineages. Of we had a hell of a game of that going on at Dustin's house that mm-hmm. Scott was running, and yeah. Yeah. we were, we were running it as both the Birthright's campaign, but then we also had a separate D and D game that went along with it, and it, it was a whole lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. and it's. There's been a spiritual, there's been a more agnostic spiritual successor to that recently with um, Seeds of Wars, which, in the interest of full disclosure, I've had the developer of that on the show in the past. Um, cool. Yeah. But with, and even, but even, even within, even within that, um, even if, even if you, if there's say a lore entry on, well, you used the Harpers earlier, so I'll use that as an example. Um, a lot of times with the way those things are there are written it's written as the equivalent of a of a wiki article but there mm-hmm. isn't there isn't any sort of bullet points onto how you could how you could integrate the harpers into into a campaign how to make it a, how to make it a story seed what who right. who they'd who they'd like who they dislike what their thoughts on ver- on various topics are a lot of that stuff is glossed and just and just only answering the question, who are the Harpers? And I get the feeling that with each of the factions that you're developing, um, several of those questions are going to be dipped into. Oh, yeah. Uh, Not even dipped into. The goal is to fully respond, answer, and address uh, all of those things. That's actually the decided point. That's, that's really what our focus has been. In fact, uh, I know we were putting out, getting ready to put together some updates on progress today. And one of the things that we spoke about was addressing some of those very things, uh, with what, uh, the three of us were working on, uh, this week and, and today in specific. And I know for me personally, it was about, like I said, the traditions, the superstitions, building the, the, who they are at home piece, uh, like who they are amongst themselves, how they interact with each other uh, yeah. piece for one of the factions, the Soul Society in specific. Mm. Uh, yeah. and, and so getting those pieces down. So if someone is playing a character who comes from this group, they have a series of traditions that they can choose to follow or choose not to follow. But there's a series of traditions that define this group that they now can hang on in their role play. There's no mechanical advantage to these, things, but it is something where this person has a, a comment or a series of comments that they can make in role play situations. That's going to build that engagement for a player coming from this group. Or if the players come into contact with the group and this is just the group they're dealing with, 
that's the story seed that a storyteller needs. Uh, um, yeah. You know, uh, yeah. and that's that's really um, that's 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 what the storyteller needs to get this going, right? Yeah. They need to have those traditions. So when players interact, they're like, "Oh, these are the guys that do the stone soup ritual before right. they defend a village." Right. Yeah, yeah. That now, whenever they see that, what's that? Oh, that's that soup that they make. Oh, oh, bad things are coming tomorrow. We better decide if we need to be here, uh, help yeah. them, or uh, pardon the the crassness. Unask the AO. You know, there's you don't have to worry about crassness. This is a, this is a no holds barred show. <laughs> well, and and just to touch on something else that you said too. Uh, uh, when you talk about how, like, you know, we're not claiming to go ahead and have invented how to go ahead and build factions either. You're talking to three old school World of Darkness players. I mean, Luminique and I met playing LARP way back in the in the mid '90s. You know, so like, that's really that is where we come from. And so we instead leaned the other direction. We read before we started even putting down what factions were going to be in this book, or even really kind of like what the shape of the book was going to be. We all went to our respective corners and downloaded as much as we could read as much as we could about how have other games how have other systems how have other authors put together factions um and then we you know I, look I, I was a music major i use this quote all the time but the great igor stravinsky once said that good that, that um good composers borrow great composers steal so we went through all these books and said, you know what, that's a cool concept. We want to go ahead and do that. Ooh, multiple time frames. Yeah, we want to go ahead and do that. Uh, ooh, uh, traditions and, and inner secrets and stuff like that. Ooh, we want to go ahead and grab that. Oh, we need to go ahead and talk about how do how do new people become members of this faction or, or how, how do they further the line? How do they further their own numbers and everything like that? So we need a whole section on that. So we lifted from as many... This is as we could find about how factions should be written, what resonates, what what pieces work together, what resonates when you're building that faction. So we are certainly not pretending that we invented it either, but we also have a very unique model. And the one thing that we are going to do that we find in any of our research is that not only are we going to go ahead and kind of produce a unique model, but we're going to go ahead and give people that buy the product the keys to the castle. We're going to say, here's how we laid this out. Here's why we laid this out. Here are our sources and say, this is where we got this from. Here are the questions that we asked ourselves as we were putting these things together. Here are some role tables to go ahead and help you build your own and everything like that. Like that's going to be one, probably one of the most important chapters of the book. And the, how to the build your last own. chapter of the book that we're going to write mm -hmm. and how to build your own, right? Because like, that's what this is all about. This is, these nine factions are going to be lore batteries that you can go ahead and plug and play into your campaign, wherever, whatever you're running, right? But we also know that storytellers are infinitely creative on their own and that they are thirsty for something that resonates in their world. And if they see one of the factions in here, but they feel like it just needs to be tweaked a little bit or it's not quite right or that it needs a different plot hook, we want people to know that they have our permission to go ahead and take that and change it as what suits in their world. We're giving right. you ideas. We're giving you, we're giving you plot hooks that we think resonate with us but we're also telling you here how here's how to go ahead and do the thing that we did to go ahead and make it work in your game yes absolutely if it lights up your imagination in a different way change that name change that tradition and one of the ones that we wrote change anything you want yep, or absolutely. start from the ground up and yeah. we'll show you how we did it and hopefully it'll help you create your own yeah. In addition to the research on factions in specific Glenn, Josh and I are constantly reading and reviewing game craft and technique we listen to other podcasts we listen to other content creators we interview a lot of content creators and part of that process both in specifically game craft but even outside of that we just did a great interview with the with the product producer of yeah. uh of the secrets of blackmore of the dave arneson movie that's currently on amazon yeah. oh yeah amazon Griff, i know him yeah, and 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 part yeah. of it was a really cool of, guy. We enjoyed talking to him. Yeah, it was, it was a wonderful time. conversation. But part of that was gleaning information on the types of things that resonate with people and gamers. You know, he's a gamer talking to the original gamers uh, mm -hmm. a, a, about how they formed the game. There are pearls and nuggets and mines of information of gold that's there, platinum, in fact 
that's there to uh, be plugged and placed into our books, and we're in the process of doing that. I've been listening to a great review of the DMG, uh, and this is to go back to an earlier piece of our conversation tonight about how uh, the code did not provide great tools for storytellers or, and game game masters and dungeon masters. Well, there's a great review from um, let me get the name of the group uh, from Mastering Dungeons podcast with Teos and and, uh, and such, where they've been going through chapter by chapter each chapter of the of the DMG, and the refrain each chapter is we saw what they were trying to do, but here's where they missed the mark. Right, so I just doesn't paying... actually tell you how to do anything. <laughs> yeah, it, right. It, it gives you all these things, but assumes so much. So as we yep. are creating our various products, we're we're kind of addressing those areas. We're filling in those gaps that uh, all the products have tried to do and not done. And that's what that's 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 the space in which we live. That's the space in which we create. Honestly, that's the space in which third party content creators are supposed to fill in. Right. Not that's where in, we've played for years. Yeah. You know, we've always played in that space in between. Right. What's the story behind the story? What happens between the big adventure? You know, we but, can do t- two or three downtime sessions and have just as much fun as the big battle, uh, boss battle, if not more. Right. Uh, think, that's that's where the role play is. I think part of the reason that we've been successful as a podcast and as we're and part of the reason we're becoming successful as a content creation company. Heck, we already are. We've put out, we're on our fourth book, so I can say we're, <laughs> exactly. we're successful yeah, yeah. as a content creation company. We're still on the rising curve. But part of the reason for that is we've been touching on it all night is we listen. We listen to the other guests that, that we bring in on our shows. We listen to all of these other amazing gamers and these amazing influencers in the space and the things that they're doing. And not everything they're doing resonates with us. And that's cool. But the parts that we like, we incorporate into not just our games, but our gaming mentality, our game design, and our company. And slowly but surely over the time, since we've been running this podcast for the last three years, um, we also, most importantly, listen to our fans and what they like and what they like in our games and talk to us about in their own games. Mm -hmm. And that is what I think truly gives us the abilities to succeed because we're hmm. I had a word that I was building towards and you know what it did? It just went <laughs> poof and ran out of my head. Yeah. Uh, but that's okay. That's okay. I can work with this. Uh, but we, we listen and now, three years later, I am a better storyteller. I'm a better player. I'm a better game designer than I was when we started three years ago. Yeah, and it's been sure. an incredible journey. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's without, where I was going. Yeah, without any hesitation, um, one of the greatest one of the greatest benefactors of my time with this podcast and our production uh, company has been the players in my home games. Uh, they are witnessing a higher caliber of game than I have ever mustered before. Uh, <laughs> and they get the, to be first play testers on like everything. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> that's, the, that's the dirty secret. Shh. <laughs> Let's not give that one away. They might be listening. They'll they'll be listening. Um, yeah. But you know, <laughs> but that that's a, that's a very true statement. I mean, the fact that we run games, we run a game for our patrons. We actually also run a an actual play. Uh, the fact that we've been running actual plays for quite some time now. Uh, I think some of the better actual plays that are out there on podcast um, from from a while we may not have a lot of the bells and whistles uh, definitely the role play is on point the 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 quality of the players we have in our broadcast actual play is off the chain uh, I I sit and I listen to because I'm one of I'm one of the editors uh, I listen to the episode that I did not personally run and I'm like oh my god, that was great. How cool would it have been to be at the table when that happened? You know, hmm. uh, and then I, and, and and similarly, I'm sitting here running some of these games when some of the cool things happen, and I'm like, holy crap, this is like the greatest thing since we got together last month. You know, <laughs> and, and, and I think about the fact that these are a lot of the situations we create for those role players to do their thing we are creating because of the techniques that we've discussed, we've researched, discussed, fine-tuned, written, 
edited and public play tested and published we're doing the things that we talk about on our show we're doing the things that appear in our publications and our games are amazing uh you know uh and and this is not to spend this whole discussion patting ourselves on the back, but just to talk about why <laughs> this is so important to us to get these tools out there, because we just we really feel strongly that these will benefit players and game and game masters out. There. Strongly feel that. Mm -hmm. And something something else on that on that front that I do. I do find um in, I do find interesting especially when you when you mention that what you guys have been trying to what you guys have been trying to do is um addre address things that like w WotC hasn't um when it comes to the concept of factions let's let's look at let's look at a few examples with let's look at a few examples within popular culture regarding um fantasy you have whether it be whether it be the likes of game whether it be the likes of Game of Thrones whether it be the likes of The Witcher whether mm -hmm. it be the whether it be the likes of of um ver of various um sci-fi and fantasy um video games and sh and shows you have lo you have large groups within them especially if um nations or nation states are so are somehow involved tell it in Something like Mass Effect Two, you had three, per, you had three factions of just mercenaries. Some yeah. of, sometimes they'd get along, sometimes they wouldn't. But it was a, but each of them had a particular style on how they approached that was reflected within their um, combat doctrine. And I think, and the reason I bring up those elements in in popular culture is. You have a whole generation of people who are who want to get into the hobby, and that kind of stuff is going to be their background. But when there's not a whole lot of stuff to support that, <clears throat> they feel they feel they're going to feel like they're hitting their head on a glass ceiling. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to I used to get a lot of shit way back in the day because I had the gall to take inspiration from things like video games or th things like things like manga. Things that things that were not the approved um, sources of inspiration, you know, what, whether that be whether that be Moorcock, whether that be Tolkien, whether it be Howard. I like those guys, but again, shouldn't have to be limited to that. And I had warned people, and this was 2003 when I said this, that you were going to have a whole generation for whom, um, El, for whom Elric of Milnimede, Conan. Fafford and the Grey Mauser were not their introductions to fantasy. Their introductions are going to be in video games. It's going to be in ma in manga. It's going to be in in, cer in certain comics. It's going to be in uh, in other shows. And they're going to come in and want to want to um, make want to make adventures that are within that particular framework. Just like the people who came before them that did that exact thing. And I know this because. Mm -hmm. There's 700 in, there's there's over 700 interviews on this channel that go into exactly that. But right. so, when that's not supported, um you can't people I know some I know some vets might say we'll just we'll just house rule that. Um that's effectively taking somebody at the to, to the deep end of the pool, pushing them in and telling them swim, damn it. And right. what happens is you'll get a few that swim, yep, and you'll get a bunch that get out of the water and never go back, and that's what we're never trying to back. stop, yep. right? So, uh, yeah. and we're not even going to talk about the ones that drown, right? We're just so what we're trying to do is stop that. And you're correct; there are so many entrances that the house that is role play and story has so many doors. And anybody who's gatekeeping or trying to funnel people through a specific two or three doors is foolish, and they are actually working against their own uh, ends, right? Because if you think about it, I did not come into fantasy. The first fantasy stories I dealt with was not Tolkien. The first fantasy stories I dealt with as a reader was reading the books after watching Star Wars, which, by the way, is a fantasy series set in a sci-fi aesthetic but it's a fantasy series 
That's why it is. A, so you guys started state, with the it, EU. Um, I'm guessing. I'm guessing a, bit, a good amount of Timothy Zahn's work. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's far after I got started. I'm talking a New Hope was. I saw the new a New Hope opening night. Uh, but we're old. Uh, yeah, I'm, yeah. Uh, but <laughs> we're old. Uh, I, I was in college when Timothy Zahn's work started coming. But when A New Hope came out, that was a fantasy series. And one of the things I started doing when I was probably 12 or so, so five or six years after, like Empire Strikes Back had come out, I had read somewhere that George Lucas formed a lot of his work based on some older stories, and specifically some Kurosawa films. And then I had to find out what Kurosawa was about. And I, so I'm 12 years old trying to figure out what Kurosawa is. But fortunately, all those movies were showing on Saturday after went through the creature double feature. You were likely to see Seven Samurai channels. All of a sudden, I'm watching these films. I'm like, oh. And then I remember my my stepfather used to watch a lot of westerns. I'm like, that's the Magnificent Seven. That's Seven Samurai. There are elements mm -hmm. of that in Star Wars. And I start realizing that these are all stories. The aesthetic is a different thing. So, and, and these stories come out. Then you go into a show like Star Trek, and while that the whole thing may not be any one of those things, individual episodes are absolutely pieces of that story tradition where each individual episode has some impetus from elsewhere, and that's what we're trying to do here. When we are story prompts, we're building story prompts that... Some of that lineage can be traced back to some of those older stories. Some of the parables we're talking could go back to Aesop or Machiavelli or Sun Tzu or, all, or, or Beowulf. Any number of, of traditions from various groups. Uh, and all done with the, with, in, in the concept of providing good basis for story. Never to appropriate, but always to uh, showcase. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to showcase story through our work and through gameplay. And what I find is players feel connected. When a story resonates, they connect with their character better, they're engaged better, and then the challenges with keeping a table together beyond six sessions start to evaporate when they're into the story. When their characters resonate, there might be an episode that they miss here or there, but they're going to be there more often than not because it is more a baseball game that they didn't really want to watch. Uh, you know, the trip to get some jujubes or to get some uh, a, an extra thing of chips from the from the corner store uh, are, is a bit less important than showing up to that next game, or at least they'll hit the corner store on the way. That happens when people engage, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to help people engage with the game and engage in this hobby with each other so they get to spend more time at a table with their friends. Mm -hmm. And to that to that particular end, it's this is why this is why guidance is um important because is it possible that somebody can eventually become a seasoned GM by just by just mistaking their way into experience? Yes. Not Absolutely, also we did. It also but it took like down. forty years. Um, yeah. But on on the other hand, it do, it does take a certain type of personality to stick to stick with things. But I will yeah. men, I will mention a, since you mentioned Kurosawa, I will mention a few things I find amusing. Um, one, Kurosawa and Lucas do have one thing in common: they both saw themselves as editors and get and got peer pressured into doing direction. Um, yes. Like Kur Kurosawa <laughs> outright said, the only reason he became a um, film director was was so he had something to edit. And two, <laughs> um, Kur and I'm not sure if this was actually the case or if Kurosawa was saying this in jest. He claimed that he made that he made more money off of the Magnificent Seven's royalties than he ever did on Seven Samurai. But I, would I don't doubt that. I, would, yeah. I don't doubt that for w not one moment. That is absolutely yeah. has to be a fact. But Absolutely on the other hand, from what from what I recall, he really, really did not like the um, film the film scene in Japan. Oh, I can understand that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I can imagine that. I mean, probably they had they probably had had limitations on like kind of like. Uh, 
All right, when and this is going to be real deep here for a minute, but basically when the when the October Revolution happened in Russia, they came into the the October Revolution happened in an era where Russian film was a vibrant scene. Mm-hmm. And the one thing that the October Revolution did more than anything else was it started limiting the amount of available film stock that people who were making films had access to. And I can imagine how in kind of like a post World War II kind of Japan era that could have been a very similar situation. Mm-hmm. I mean, Kurosawa was making films kind of before and after that, so you know. But yeah. I can imagine how he could have seen how the how the uh, the scene changed in Japan at that time, mm-hmm. uh, and it affected his opinion of it. Yeah. yeah well, I would. I, I, I would also say that his themes were not necessarily in keeping with Imperial Japan. Certainly yeah. not Magnificent Seven. I think Magnificent Seven is a good, um, or at least it can be interpreted as uh, somewhat against that kind of uh, uh, oppression, that type of uh, f- uh, fear, tac- fear tactic or control of the populace kind of technique that would probably been problematic for uh, a changing status quo. And it was changing at the time that we got those films over in the States, but it was changing. It hadn't changed. I think there's probably a lot of change now. Mm-hmm. But in the midst of that change, that probably made it uh, for some difficult and trying times. But um, that to say, how uh, you know, that's very similar to the area, era in which we are currently content creating. Uh, you know, when we sat down to do our last project, uh, the OGL crisis happened. We had a lot of changes that we had to consider. Uh, fortunately, things fell in such a way that we didn't have to change entirely what we're doing but did cause us to do some rethinking some restructuring a little bit um many of those lessons learned are part of the current book and oddly i think it's absolutely for the better change isn't always bad and i think it has definitely a- a- aided <laughs> us in our creative endeavors it's caused us to be more focused and um intentful uh regarding system agnosticism which allows us to reach a wider audience and make for a much better product. And, you know, that's yeah. kind of the goal for Tabletop Journeys, and that's yeah. certainly a goal that we're in the process of achieving with uh, Tabletop, or with yeah. uh, the Traveler's Guide to Factions. I think we are yeah. definitely on the right track here. Um, and, you know, as backers keep coming, and, we, you know, we are 68% of the way now when I do a short while ago um you know with uh 19 days left i believe we have we absolutely are in a position where uh we're doing all the right things and we've got all the right pieces in place we just need a few more folks to listen to shows like this listen to shows like ours want to improve their games want to get started with good games want to add some neat new things uh and uh get us across that finish line and we'll have some awesome stuff for them yeah. Now, yeah. what would you be shooting for as far as a page count for factions? Yeah, so that's a great question. The uh, the bulk of our stretch goals are stretch goals which will add content to the book. Uh, that's kind of the way that we structure all of our campaigns, right? Um, if we don't hit any stretch goals and we just have the nine factions in there, the page count's probably going to be like in the 120 to 150 range in that neighborhood because each of these factions is probably going to be... I mean, in the Google Doc that I finished for uh, for the Ember Weavers, it was a 15-page document, and it's not quite even done yet. So, you know, that's on Google Docs, and it's going to translate to probably, you know, I don't know, 15, 20 pages layout with him with art and everything like that right um and so each of these factions is going to be 120 150 pages if it's just the factions each of the stretch goals adds content so if we get to the backgrounds tier if we get to uh, you know stuff like that that's all going to increase the page count if right. we get all the way through all of our stretch goals including the adventure starters tier this is going to be over 200 pages without a doubt in my mind so mm-hmm. right. yeah. well, there'll be nine adventure board. starters and our adventure starters come out to they come to pretty close About to 10. 10 pages each. We call exactly. it a starter, yeah, yeah. but really what it is is um, it is a full plot with suggestions on how you can flesh it out to bring it more to life, but it's all very, it's truncated. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it, those it, by it, themselves would be almost 100 pages. That's gonna That would be like 90 pages yeah. on its own if, if we make it to that. And yeah. right. when are you planning on having the Kickstarter launch? So the Kickstarter launch... So the Kickstarter is already active. Um, it runs through October 24th. Yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to t- <laughs> take you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Kickstarter <laughs> launched last Thursday, so it's been running for about four or five days at this point. Uh, and it runs until October 24th. Mm-hmm. 
and I, I do wish you get I do wish you guys the the best of luck on the development of it. And so, in lieu of um, jinxing, you yeah. probably couldn't hear it, but I just knocked on some wood because, <laughs> because <laughs> jumped in there too. You know how they say yep. there's no atheists in foxholes? I believe there's no atheists <laughs> at a gaming table as well. Right, right. Oh. When you're waiting to see if your Kickstarter crosses the line. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. But with that said, I do want to give my sincere thanks to you, to you guys for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As Thank I you. often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And of course, a nice. sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>